Welcome back, Canonites. Another week has passed, bringing with it another Cannon Fodder article. So, let's dive right in. To start, something I failed to mention last week was the fact that Halo Nightfall's second stories are now available on the Halo channel, independent of Nightfall itself. Grouped into three collections, the 15 shorts give us a deeper look into the events told in Halo Nightfall. The three collections are Acquisition, detailing how the deadly element made its way to Cedra. Human Element, a closer look at those affected by the terrorist attack. We get insight into those mining the element, the Oni agents tracking it, and the civilians and responder teams affected in the aftermath. Finally, Intervention, a closer look at how Oni is constantly going to any length necessary to get answers and intel. I've talked about most of these second stories in detail during my reviews of the Nightfall episodes, but I'll say it here again, watch these. Whether you liked Nightfall or not, or if you haven't seen them, I highly encourage you to watch these shorts. They are all extremely well done and give a lot of insight into the post-war status of humanity and the relationship between Colonials and the UNSC slash Oni. From a canon standpoint, some of the episodes are just looks at characters or situations, but many fall under a series of in-universe reports known as Oni Eyes Files. Within Nightfall, at least, these are collected by an agent known as Codename Fixer. Fixer, throughout the second stories that are Oni Eyes Files, is trying to gain insight into the terrorist attacks on Cedra, seemingly trying to find out what went wrong in the first place and examine the aftermath of the events. The main focus of this week's cannon fodder is a closer look at a particular second story from Human Element, known as Trade Barriers. An Oni Eyes file, the episode is part of an autopsy report by one Dr. Bryn Morad. Throughout, she is trying to find out if what had happened to the victims on Cedra had occurred elsewhere, eventually leading her to a classified file and a larger mystery. This week gives us a closer look at what she examined on her computer, made unclear in the episode due to our perspective, and is presented in the form of a classified report, much like those present in various books over the years. The file is a nice bit of nostalgia for longtime fans, containing references to past events and characters, while also giving further insight into what Dr. Morad was looking for, and telling a tale of a colony's descent into anarchy. The file starts with the usual babble in such reports, but we can clearly note that Dr. Morad's investigation has raised an orange flag for Oni. Further down, we see that the files are from Codename Fixer, and being sent to a familiar name for those who have read some of Halo's earlier books, Codename Surgeon. In Halo Fall of Reach and Ghosts of Onyx, Codename Surgeon is commonly seen communicating with another agent, Codename Coal Miner. Near the start of the Human Covenant War, the two were involved in Operation Hypodermic, an effort to collect information on the Covenant. The operation was put on hold following the discovery and subsequent fall of Reach. In the post-war era, the two were again working together, discussing and monitoring the state of the galaxy. These communications were known as the Eleventh Hour Reports. Moving forward, we get into the actual meat of the report. It starts with a brief explanation regarding Dr. Morad's search for cases similar to those of the dead on Cedra. Her search is specifically for black veins, cross-referenced with Guillain-Barre, a disease in which the immune system attacks the nerves. Attacking the nerves, that, uh, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? The search leads to one result, the case of Indrid Loda. Interestingly, the case file is listed as Z-220-801, now, I may be reading too much into things here, but recall that human designations for Forerunner technology always begin with a Z, e.g. the Z4190 bubble shield or the Z180 scattershot. We know that the attack on Cedra used an element native to a piece of Alpha Halo, and the episode Trade Barrier implies that Indra died in the same manner as the dead on Cedra. Of course, Indra died in 2554, two years before the attack on Cedra. The plot thickens. The next line of the report is very interesting, reading as... Flag match, element 120.v, tags SD302 through SD535 confirmed. Confirm KIA, agent 73968-00463-JG, said med tag SD511. So, a couple things. First, we can finally identify the element used in the attack, a variation of element 120 noted as 120v. To note, the highest confirmed element on the periodic table is element 118 on an octium, though there are theoretically elements up to the 170s. Though element 120 has not been generated or observed in the real world, it does have a placeholder name, Unbenilium. Much like the element we see in Nightfall, Unbenilium is expected to be extremely unstable. Whether it would actually only kill humans is, of course, unknown. The second point of interest is the mention of the Oni agent. This is Agent Jordan Gaines, one of the two Oni agents affected by the bioweapon. It's strange that she's the only one listed as KIA here, when Agent Mason Hunley was also affected. 
Whether this means he survived or is simply in a different group, I can't say for sure, though I would probably guess the latter. A couple lines later in the report, we see the mention of the tug that was found on Cedra following the attack, and it notes a flight record to Z-620. My guess would be that Z-620 is the designation for the Alpha Fragment. Following this, we get into the actual report itself, which shows the various articles that Dr. Morad was reviewing when making her search inquiry. There's a little more than I'd like to actually go over in a video like this, so I encourage you to check it out yourselves. The history of Alaria, the planet the smugglers Haizal Wari and Aris Lee were from, is touched on in Nightfall in the second story Indebted Travelers, and detailed further in the Halo Universe articles about the two Alarians, but the articles that Dr. Morad views gives us a much better look at its history. The planet was once a rich resource of minerals, leading to a rush for employment and vast numbers of opportunities. Unfortunately, a drought that would end up lasting more than a century transformed the planet into a desert and plunged the society into anarchy. The article snippets in the report are fascinating to read, so I encourage you to check out the link in the description below and read it for yourself. The report comes to a close, noting that the information Dr. Morad was looking for must be quarantined, and noting that a copy was sent to HQS SOC UNSC, which I think means High Quality Screening Special Operations Command for UNSC. Please correct me if I'm wrong, military abbreviations aren't my strong suit. The final line of the report contains a base 64 code that, when decoded, reads, Even a broken ring can surround us in danger. Ominous. Again, please check out the full thing for yourselves. It's very insightful and a lot of fun to read. This week's cannon fodder comes to a close with a reminder about the upcoming release of Halo New Blood. The book will sadly only be released in digital format at first, but given the language used in the announcement, I expect a print version is going to come eventually. The book releases tomorrow, and following the release, a follow-up interview with author Matt Forbeck will be posted, one containing spoilers about the story. More than likely, this will be included in next week's cannon fodder. As always, we end with a look at the new Halo Universe entries. This week is all about Alpha 9, the ODST squad Buck led into New Mombasa on October 20th, 2552. The articles are Gunnery Sergeant Edward Buck, Captain Veronica Dare, Corporal Taylor Dutch Henry Miles, Lance Corporal J.D., The Rookie, Private First Class Michael Mickey Crespo, and Lance Corporal Kojo Romeo Agu. Most of the information in these articles is repeated from Halo 3 ODST, the character profiles on Bungie.net, and the other various bits of media released over the years, as the articles are mostly meant to bring people up to speed before New Blood releases. However, there are still bits of new information strewn throughout. In Buck's entry, we learn that he was trained on Earth and Reach following his enlistment, and has been fighting on the front lines for practically the entire Human Covenant War. His actions during a six-month campaign on Harvest earned him entry into the ODST training program in 2532. We also learned that Buck's only regret was that he wasn't present to defend his homeworld, Draco III, when it was attacked in 2554. In addition, it is noted that Buck's bloodlust was only tempered due to his relationship with Veronica Dare. His desire for revenge likely would have led to his death otherwise. In Dare's entry, we learn her service number, her birth date, December 4th, 2515, and her homeworld, Actium. Of note, Actium was first mentioned in the Halo Waypoint video series, Heroes Never Die. You can check it out on YouTube. For the rookie, we learn his birth date, February 9th, 2525, and a bit more information about his mission on New Jerusalem. In the short story Dirt from Halo Evolutions, the rookie was deployed on New Jerusalem where he encountered an injured ODST. The article reveals that the rookie had been deployed near the city of Mount Haven as part of a team defending the transport of a Forerunner artifact. And that pretty much wraps things up. Like I said, a lot of these articles contain old information though they are still certainly worth reading, especially if you haven't kept up with every bit of information that's been dropped over the years. Thank you for joining me as always. For now, this has been Halo Cannon, and I'll see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. It means more than I could express in a few minutes of audio. If you did like it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, share it around on whatever social media you see fit, and all that jazz. Thank you so much. Your support is everything. I would not be where I am without you. Thanks.